in order to stay alive these days, it's work. In order to be in a relationship, it's work. In order to be in a work relationship, it's work. It is work. And this is what people sometimes forget. Welcome to the Happy Engineer Podcast, the place where we help engineers like you to build your career, balance your life, and be happy. I'm Zach White, former engineer turned lifestyle engineering coach and your host for the journey to the career and life that you desire. Hey, I believe that you shouldn't have to sacrifice your life to reach your full potential at work. And what we're gonna bring you in these conversations and interviews are the strategies, the tools, and the mindsets that are gonna allow you to experience both success at work and success at home. Hey, we do the best we can to keep this free from advertisements. Of course, I can't control what YouTube may throw up, but do us a favor and share this podcast with anybody who you think may like it. And don't forget to click the bell and subscribe and get notifications to our YouTube channel and for upcoming releases of the Happy Engineer podcast. I would love your feedback and even more than that, love your story. Share with us how these strategies and tools are working for you. Would love to be in touch with you. Connect with us on social media. Find me at Oasis of Courage on Instagram, Facebook, or Zach White on LinkedIn. It's an absolute pleasure to serve you. Now let's do this. Happy engineers, you're in for an incredible treat today. I'm sitting with my good buddy, chef extraordinaire, Charles Webb, he's got on his title here. Chef Charles, who I met years ago at the National Restaurant Association. We're gonna look at that moment in just a moment, event there in Chicago, Illinois. And this guy is absolutely full of life. And you're gonna see what I mean by that in just a little bit. But Chef Charles, thanks for making time to be with me and uh, the happy engineers out there today. It's awesome to see you, man. You don't have to thank me. I'm thanking you because look at this. We get a chance to wrap and catch up. And here I am and the Admirals Club, the American Airlines Admirals Club in Miami on my way to Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. And, and we get to do a little mixing it up today. So yeah, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. And what I love is that you being in the Admirals Center in Miami, is just like another day in the life for Chef Charles Webb. Most people are like, oh, that seems really random, but this is probably a place- airport. Yeah. <laughs> Hop it around. So, so let's do this. I think it'd be really curious to hear your perspective about how we met, like your impressions of Zach White on day one. I'm really curious. Take us back to that moment and how we first connected. What was your Zach White day one experience? Yeah, I mean, you know, we're there pounding the pavement at the NRA show, the National Restaurant Association show, about 75, 80,000 people in Chicago at the McCormick Place. I mean, they're they're packing them to the brim. And there I am, and I walk on the carpet over there into the KitchenAid Whirlpool area, I believe it was. Yeah. And there you were, there you were with your colleagues. One was from like Columbia, and then like another one was from Michigan. And we rolled up and you just had this gravitating energy pull personality and you were there to serve. You were there to like, let's connect some, can I say effing dots? Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and I was there to have some dots connected. So I said, look at this. I mean, look, here we are. And the gal that I was with at the time she, on my team, she was running marketing and some other pieces for us. And you guys started to talk and then you and I started to talk. And then the next thing, you know, we're like, Hey, we got to make sure we go back there and see that guy, Zach, that, that dude's cool. Like we liked him and that was it. And then we just, you know, the road of life took all of its turns and here we are. I love hearing that. And I'm, I'm glad it was a positive impression. The idea of connecting dots. I'm glad that you said that because that's exactly what I remember about that moment. And, you know, for the engineering leader listening, like, where are they going with this? What are we talking about? Like, there's going to be some really golden nuggets in this whole journey of how your story plays into our lives. But what I remember the most was that in the three minutes that we first started talking, 
it was obvious that you had a much bigger vision than anybody else I had met that day in terms of what's possible and how you were putting these puzzle pieces together for something that was not just big, but really exciting and something you wanted to get behind. And that just stood out to be like in the first three minutes. And so t- take us back a little bit to the, the genesis of you casting that vision. Like, where did it begin? Give us some of the Genesis story of what you're doing with hashtag chef on tour and everything that's been born from that dot connecting process. It's, it's interesting because 61 months and a few days ago, I started with an idea to create digital content around the world that was extremely fun and engaging and I was already living a very global life. I was already in a lot of different parts of the world. I found myself in Monaco during the Formula One. I was actually cooking on the last yacht that came out of the same shipyard that the Titanic came out of, which was the yacht that they filmed Life Aquatic with Steve Zizou on, which was not the yacht that these guys who hired me were supposed to get. They were supposed to get this beautiful white floating palace, and they got this yacht, and it ended up that I brought my team in. And we thought that we did all the provisioning, purchasing of everything we needed for the race, you know, for the three, four days that we were on there. And there we were running through Nice at 1130 in the morning on Sunday, race day, trying to get all the, all the products and everything we needed together. And at the end of it, it was, I I just, I won't even go down that story, but just the, the gist of it was, is that we got everything we needed. Can you imagine like race day in Monaco, which is 30, 40 minutes from Nice, Nice being one of the big hubs to go shopping in and, not, mm-hmm. and everything is either closed on Sundays or we're lucky to. And so we get things and, you know, and there we are. And so my friend said, look, you're living a life of like a, a TV show. You got to do something about it. And then we fast forward uh, New Year's Day in Rio de Janeiro, Rio, uh, you know, 61 months ago. And I started to create an idea with this idea in mind of creating a digital series, my idea was at a 60 minute or 30 minute show, but we were going to do cannabis. And this was before Bong and Petit and all of that. And my idea was to be able to take it into the cannabis world and do it in the parts of the world where it was legal. We're talking about Christiania and Copenhagen. We're talking about, of course, Amsterdam, you know, Montevideo and Uruguay, you know, places that were maybe a little bit ahead of the curve six, seven years ago or whatever, whatever that was, six, six, five, six years ago. And I created something called Ringmaster. And that's where the digital series started. And we got a little deep into it. And we said that that is not where we want to go. There were a lot of things that were shifting. I didn't think it was the right time for it. And so I created something called Hashtag Chef on Tour uh, shortly thereafter. And that was it. We were out globe trotting. We We did the first one in Panama. The reason being was I didn't want to do it in Chicago, my hometown, where I have all the resources and everything. So I said, look, this is going to be interesting. Let me tie both of my arms, one of my legs behind my back. Yeah. Let's go to Panama and let me take my team that doesn't speak Spanish. Of course, I speak, yo hablo perfectamente español, falo portugués como brasileiro, falo italiano como italiano. So I've lived in um, nine countries in the world. I speak four languages, fluently, fortunately. But the interesting thing about it was we went there and, and boom, you know, we, I wanted to see if it was going to work. So any great idea... You need to push it to the depths to yes. see if it's going to work. And that's what we did. We pushed the idea to the depth. We went to Panama. We walked out of there, I guess, like 12 days later. And I said to my team, that did not work. That really worked. And I said, we are in for a much bigger journey. And 61 months later, a lot of slipping and sliding on the slopes. We went to Bogota. We went to Rio. We started to work with brands as we were. We were this is what we were talking that's to right. KitchenAid. And, you know, that's a, that's a long-winded intro, guys. Are you still but it's But it's awesome. So, so here's what's so cool. And, and I want to tease out what about that narrative, to me, is exactly the heartbeat of lifestyle engineering and the work that we do at Oeco with our engineering leader clients is the fact that you took a part of your already born inside you desire and passion and lifestyle that was there and just said, hey, there's something here that's worthy of pursuing with my life's energy, and you created a vision, that ultimately that first iteration looked nothing like what it looks like today. And this process of wayfinding, just a willingness to get out of your comfort zone again and again and again, that's what's so inspiring about the story to me is like, you have that absolute willingness to say, 
I don't know how this next step is going to turn out, but let's push it to the edge and find out. Where did that part of you come from, Chef? Is, has that always um, been there? Have you always been that way? I mean, if I had if I had both hands free, I would be dead, 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 throwing the balls up in the air and like, you know, the clown at the circus. I mean, I, I think a lot of that is just improvising, making lemonade, I guess that, that's the best one, right? Making lemonade out of lemons, figuring out, being resourceful, you know, not having a lot of resources and yet making really cool things happen, taking that to that next level, taking it to the next level. And then actually when this all came about, realistically, it started to mold into my purpose. So this is very interesting because sometimes we do jobs or we go through the motions of doing things and that might not be your purpose in life. Maybe it's a vehicle to get you to your purpose or it helps you along the way. And for me, you know, food and beverage, I've had 92 jobs in my life, 70 some odd percent of them have been in food and beverage, F and B. A lot of that has kind of like brought me into that. It's not like you could put your finger on it. I mean, life, it's life, right? It's trial and error. It's not getting, you know, a hundred percent every time, but learning from all of those mistakes and those challenges yeah. and just getting back up, getting back up. And society is very cruel sometimes to, to judge us. Let's say yeah. we need to build more resiliency and, and understand it's okay to make these errors to a certain extent to a certain point. I still make certain errors sure. uh, in my life. I mean, so I'm human. <laughs> this is, this is important to highlight, especially for the engineering mind. And I'm on the opposite end of the spectrum. And like you and I came from different worlds and, and here's what engineers want. Uh, and people who are just listening on the podcast can't see it, but it's a straight line growth. It's a nice, straight, easy thing. Like I'm just going to just plow my life ahead to the goal. Everything is smooth sailing. And honestly, Chef, if I showed somebody one of your promotional videos of hashtag chef on tour right now, and that's all they knew about you, they would probably think this guy has it together. He's always been on a great track. He's a great personality. He's famous. He's this, he's that. But 92 jobs. Right. Chef, 90, I mean, that's a lot, man. So, so the yeah. trial and error, the willingness to get up and, and fall, yeah. get up and fall, it has not been a straight line for you. Yeah. yeah, and that's it. That's, that's Let me just jump in there really quick because I think that's Please. extremely important. I, I think that you're talking about a straight line from an analytical standpoint to think about how you get from point A to point B. And then you flip that around and you think about how we live our lives and how we want to think linear, but the secret is thinking out of the box and thinking nonlinear, isn't it? Y yes, <laughs> I love this. So help help me understand how you practice nonlinear thinking in your world? What does that actually look like for, for you? It's not something that I'm conscious about. First off, I think it's just, I don't live in a corporate world. I've never lived in a corporate world. I took a couple of corporate jobs. I had a hard time conforming, being molded to certain, certain ways. I was kind of a cowboy, a rebel you know, in others. And I think that that's all has a lot to do with, you know, how I grew up. Listen, I mean, I didn't even think I was going to go to university. I went to a city college, a community college, and then I went to another community college, and then I went to a city college, and then I went to a university, and then I got the degree there. And then I went to business school in Rome and I got, you know what I mean? So it was, nothing was, none of that was like, hey, go to school for four years, get your degree, get your resume all polished up or your CV. You know, I didn't, I didn't live that way, you know, and, and that's not how I look at things. And the more that I had that nonlinear way of thinking, the more how I saw it could work, it could really work for me. You think about a chef, a chef is a creative. So that's the right side of your brain, right? But on the left side of your brain, what you find is the analytical, that the whole analytical side. So I was able to kind of develop both of those spheres in different ways to help me along. I want to say to everybody listening. We're not, no way saying like, hey, you got to quit your job and be a nomad and run around and do everything. If you went to college for four years straight to be an engineer, you made a mistake. Like that, That's not the message here. But what I think is no. really important to highlight is that when we look around our companies, I coach hundreds of folks and I get a really unique perspective into engineering organizations all around the world. And the thing that stands out is everybody kind of looks around and there's always that guy or that girl who's breaking some of the rules, who's not following the straight line, who's doing it different than everyone else and getting these disproportionate results. And a lot of times people look at that and like, kind of get frustrated. Like, wait a minute, how did they do that? How did that 
happen. And so what Chef Charles is describing, <laughs> what you're saying, it's, I think it's a really important thing for us all to lean into to say, where is the system, the, the man, maybe if we're using the cliche phrase, laid out that analytical linear path, but that's not actually the only way to move forward. This wayfinding willingness to press in and do different things, it, it's valuable anywhere. It's valuable anywhere. If, if you were sitting across from somebody who really felt constrained in that box, Chef Charles, and you were going to give them advice, how would you frame it? How would you help somebody or challenge them to say like, hey, let's get outside the norm, get outside the box? What would that, yeah, what would that pep, I, pep I think, talk look like? It's kind of like cooking. So like, hey, maybe you should start cooking for yourself. Well, that could be a little overwhelming, right? Where do I start? What's my starting point? And God, cooking what? Maybe I'm from India and I cook a certain time. Maybe I'm from Northern India. Northern India is different than South and Southern India that's different than Western. Or maybe I'm from a different part of the world. Or maybe I'm, 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 I am in a box of like, I'm a vegetarian or I'm a vegan or I am a carnivore, or I eat everything or whatever. And it could all be very overwhelming. So you just got to figure out where it is that you start to branch out from and what's the best thing to start to branch out from to think the closest things to you, right? Find a low hanging fruit, where the yeah. interests are, where are you excited? Obviously speaking the languages, even like speaking Portuguese, Portuguese was the last language that I learned. And, and it's a complicated language out of the lot languages. And at the time, my ex-wife spoke four or five languages. She's Brazilian. She was educated with uh, Portuguese as their first language. And, but you know what, what was I, what was I reading? I was reading things that interested me and I was thinking about sentence structure and I was thinking about building vocabulary and I was also thinking about how not to go and use other languages as a crutch for that because it's very easy to do. So basically figuring out what do you love, but you're not really doing or what do you like and you'd like to play around with it. And listen, you don't have to be the best at, you know, just kind of start to go from there. You might start with A and end up on J. That's just how it is. But you need a, you need a good starting point. And, you know, the journey of a million miles starts with one step, right? I love this. So you may agree with this statement. What I've found with the majority of engineers, and I'm going to paint with the broad brush. So, uh, of course, I'm going to likely upset somebody here. But if there was a level of emotional experience, emotional experience, the intensity of emotional experience that engineers experience. Most of us operate in this really narrow band around neutral. You know, life never really gets that exciting and we do our best to keep it from getting too negative and we just operate in this really narrow band. And, and then people complain about the fact that they're not experiencing passion, they're not experiencing love, they're burned out or they're just bored or frustrated about their career. They don't really have any enthusiasm. And so this idea of finding something you love and just start, find a starting point. Can you tell us your starting point with food? I mean, you're a passionate guy, period. But tell us about how that particular area got started for you. I think it's interesting because food started with me uh, as a single parent mom having to go out and fight for her son, me and her, and teaching me how to cook at home with non-processed foods and stuff like that. And that's kind of how my mom's mindset was. But that's not really where it started. You know, I, I worked in the kitchen later down the road and I worked in places and it didn't take me long to realize that my girlfriend at the time who was a waitress was making a lot of money and I wasn't. And I was burnt and I was sweaty and she wasn't. And I said, I think I could do what she's doing. And so I went in front of the house. So the trajectory wasn't necessarily A, it, it led me to somewhere else and then it led me back eventually when I figured out how to monetize on it or just I could live on it beyond just living on it uh, and finding the passion behind it. And then obviously what I learned in between all of that, where a lot of people think the passion and what's driving it is the food. And it's really that innate feeling inside of me to almost serve, to see you, your eyes light up, to see your energy go get to another level when you've had something that it's really special for you. And that's not just something that you put in your mouth, but that's the experience, that energy mm. that, that's vibrated along the way through 
just different experiences. You know, I mean, our tagline for so long, it's not just food, it's an experience. And no one got that until people started to say, hey, we're going to create experiences because that's what people want. And it's like, yeah, of course. I mean, I've been saying that for five, six years, and that's what we've been doing. And then people are starting to dial into that. Does all of that make sense? I hope I didn't get oh, off track. No, I love this. And actually what you just said is super important and counterintuitive in a way that maybe not counterintuitive. I'm not sure what the right word is, but I, I want to get more into this. The passion for you is not primarily or maybe foundationally rooted in food itself. That's a vehicle for you to there express you this part that's creative and innovative, but the part of you that loves to serve in that way. I think that's super important distinction. And engineers, we've got your automotive types. They love cars, but there's something about, it's, it's not just the car. You know, it's not the the suspension system they're designing, et cetera. The, the thing that stirs up the passion is that feeling they get when the Mustang drives down the street and they look at that and say, I had a part to play in allowing that person to experience the thrill of driving a Mustang because I helped sure. create that. And you might see that person's eyes and be like, oh my yeah. God, look at that. But that you could just feel like, oh my, wow, they're, they're geeky about it. They're excited about it. They're elated beyond uh, of any, totally. I mean, it's, it's just, totally. you know what I'm saying? And, and so what happens then is we get in the grind. We show up at work every day. We crank on these projects. We put in the hours, deal with all the stress of the projects. And at some point you wake up and you're doing the same thing that you were doing before feeling passion and you don't feel it anymore. Have you had that? with food? I'm just grinding it out. Did you wake up to that or make a change or like, what's your experience been with passion kind of dying? Yeah, guys, I'm going to tell you something. Everybody feels it no matter what. And the question is, what are you doing for yourself to make sure that you don't overheat? When people tell me that they haven't taken a vacation in six years, I look at them like, you're f***ing insane. You're a madman. You're crazy. And, and it's like, why? Because you're not recharging your back. Oh, I worked 18 hours today. And, you know, I, I remember I was cleaning offices in Denmark once, and we were going into this one, it was a tech company actually, and they were super, super efficient and effective with uh, like their, the 37 hours a week that they did. And like Fridays was half day and they ate pizza and drank beer and, you know, hung out and they talked, they just did a big hangout they nailed and exceeded at everything they needed to do. And I think it's about recharging those batteries and understanding what that means to keep yourself fresh. I even have a hard time trying to get my mom to understand that sometimes, oh, you're going there, you're going, you're on a plane, Charles. <laughs> and it's like, you know what? But I, we all need to recharge our batteries. We need to come out there. You talk about energy being up and all of that. Yeah. Sure. I mean, no one could run around 24 seven like that. So we all got to figure out what it is that what it is that makes us tick. Be realistic with yourself. Be realistic with your yes. mind, your body, with your soul, with your alma, your soul. Be realistic with these things. Come on, guys. These are important things to think about. When you think better, you feel better. In the mornings when I wake up and it's 4.35, 5.30 in the morning, and I'm just like, you know, like I am super productive. So think about when you excel too. Those are, those are some other things. The statement to be realistic with yourself. I think that is an area that every engineering leader needs to sit on for a moment and just leader. Ask, leader. ask that question. That's right. That becomes a top-down management issue because you need to hear that from the top. And it's kind of weird because they're pushing you and they're driving you. Yes. And they're, they're making you leaner and better and all of those things. Sure, I get it. But there's that whole other part. You're not a robot. But soon we'll have robots to do it and you won't have a job. So let's dial into the human part of it, right? How do we make humans hyper effective? It's about understanding productivity. It's about understanding. And every human's different and being okay with that. The dance that I think we all face when we're in a level of leadership. And okay, of course, everyone is a leader in your own right, whether on the org chart, it says you're, you are one or not. But specifically, I'm talking about people who have a role in the organization, senior manager, director, VP. 
there's a dance between your responsibility to the organization to push people to their maximum. And, and that is important. We want to challenge, can we be more productive? How can we be more productive? Where's the waste? How do we cut that out, et cetera? But what I found is that human element gets lost in that process because it's easier for the engineering mind to focus on the concept, the idea, the scoreboard, if you will, of are we getting those results and forgetting that humans with real life, real problems, real challenges are the ones who face the brunt of that pressure. And then every single individual starts putting that unrealistic expectation on themselves. Hey, the boss wants more, therefore I must be capable of producing more. Well, that's not always true. <laughs> and sometimes we just take no. all of that on ourselves. And then I end up meeting these engineers who are buried under an mm -hmm. expectation and a pressure sure. and a burnout sure. that the leader never really intended for you to get into this place. They just wanted to reach the pinnacle of what's possible. But your interpretation of it is, well, I must need to be Superman. I'm supposed to work 80 hours a week. Oh, and raise three kids. Oh, and take care of my health. Oh, and sleep eight hours a night. Oh, and cook fresh meals like Chef Charles does. And, 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 and it's like, be realistic. And scrub your toilets. Yeah, yeah and exactly. And scrub your toilets. Uh, but you know, I mean, even athletes have a, have a lifespan, don't they? Even, even athletes have a certain amount of time. It's a curve. So what's your curve? Think about you as a person, as that athlete or as that, you know, as that product, what's your curve and where are you at with that? And are you in a job? Are you in a situation that's taking care of you monetarily, but maybe not with all of the other things that you want to be taken care of with, but you have to prioritize what that means. What good is having a whole bunch of money if you don't have a whole bunch of health? I love that that's a cliche statement, but it's so, so true. And just to get conscious to it right now, it's, it's valuable even for me. I've said, build this business and as a coach and right. really living and practicing what I preach, I'm encouraged by that. Chef, I want to hear your perspective on this idea of courage. It's a tangential to where we just were, and I'll try to connect the dots how I got here. To lean in to, is this realistic for me? If you realize that, hey, I'm shortening my curve or the answer is no, and I want to make a change to face those environments or people or make the decisions to get into a better or different situation, I have found means facing challenges, facing fears, getting uncomfortable, having tough conversations, and you got to be courageous. And you're a guy who's done this on the regular your whole life. So talk to me about your, your relationship to courage. Where does it show up? How do you think about that for you? That's a multidimensional question slash answer, but to keep it in the macro, the generalization, let's think about where we're going with that. I think that even every processes that you do, there is a beginning, a middle and an end, right? There is a, there's a, everything is streamlined. You know where it's going and then you know what you need to do from there, right? There's only so much you can do. You're talking about cutting costs. You're talking about cutting, cutting back and peeling away. It's probably just looking at it and understanding where things, where the hiccups are going to be, where the obstacles are going to be, and how are you going to be able to navigate through that and being strong with that, being okay with it. and first and foremost, you got to be realistic to yourself before you could go out and be realistic to anybody else. That means your significant other, that means your boss, that means your colleagues, you know, and any responsibility that you have. When you say being strong, like how does that, how does that look? When was the last moment that you had to show up and be strong? How does that actually look in your life? I don't know. Cause I feel like it's happening every day. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, so being, like, so uh, how are you strong you, today? Give, yeah. I'll give you a great one that kind of parlays with where I'm at being strong. I walked into December thinking that I was going to have a blockbuster month because historically I have, I did not, I got COVID. I was weakened emotionally, physically, spiritually got back up. I, I walked into January and, and there I was in a grocery store and I started to cry and I'm in Chicago. It's cold. It's dark. 
I don't normally spend January, February, March in Chicago mm -hmm. anyway. Those days are kind of over. And I realized that I was starting to get depressed. And it's, it's very hard to, I don't think I've really shared that with very many people, but that was a moment that I had to be strong. But what I did understand, no matter who said what or who thought what or what was going on, I knew I needed to hit the eject button. So I ejected myself from that situation. There was no this, that, and the other. There was no taking drugs with it. There was no moving in one direction. I said, where is my happy place? What makes me thrive? I went to Brazil and my smile was sideways. My posture was off. My energy was off. I was bad. The lady who gives me like Reiki, who gives me energy massages, she stopped in the middle of the massage and she's like, I'm sorry, I'll be right back. She told me in Portuguese, she comes back into the room. She said, I don't know what's happening, but you know, your energy's off. And I'm like, She's like, she, she didn't say your energy's off. She's like, there's a, there's an energy on you. That's not right. And I'm like, my energy's off. And she's like, no, your energy's good, but there's an energy on you. That's not right. So for whatever that was or whatever that meant, I spent the next two weeks of working on that. So I needed to have the courage to work through something that was going to hopefully lead me out of this really kind of weird, dark space and into a very happy, positive space, which is where I'm at right now. Man, so First of all, Chef, I I really appreciate you being willing to share that story and just be vulnerable with us about what's going on. And yeah. I know that a wow. lot more people than are talking about it are feeling that way, dealing with depression, dealing with a dark time, the loss of loved ones, the loss of a job, the loss of your own identity, all these things. And some people may listen to this and say, Zach, I can't just hit the eject button. You know, Chef Charles, I don't have the luxury of just flying to Brazil and getting, you know, Reiki massages from, from an amazing lady down there to work on my energy. It's like, this doesn't, this doesn't apply to me. And I just want to challenge that perspective and say, like, hold on. You have the ability to ask the same question that Chef asked, where is my happiest place? And how can oh, I take an go. action right now to move towards it? You don't have to solve the whole problem overnight, but take the first best simplest action you can take in the direction of the things that you know are aligned with your purpose, your values, and you, what makes you happy and, and just start getting into action rather than sitting in philosophy. Now, this is the engineering mind. My, you know, I'll talk about myself. I won't point at anybody else. Chef, I love to theorize about how I could get better <laughs> rather than actually do the thing that makes me better. That's what I love about that story for you is it just said, Hey, I, I'm going to take action. Now you took really bold action, but anybody can do something. My eject button was there. Your eject button may be up the street at the park. You might exactly. walk up to the street to the park and just feel like, man, when was the last time I meditated? When was the last time I just laid here and looked up and just let my mind roam in the right way? There are a lot of different things that we could talk about with that. Then everybody's happy place or everybody's sacred place is completely different. And so just know everybody that you're certainly, you're not alone. And no matter if you could think you can sense it, or you can't, chances are you can't probably within you. I wouldn't, I didn't see it coming. I did not see it coming. I'm not a depressive person. And, and I always make little moves to make sure that, you know, things don't get a little wacky. Boy, that was wacky and it was scary. It was yeah. very scary. Yeah. You got to make, you got to make a move quick. Boy, that stuff, that stuff can move on you fast too. I'll just encourage everybody. Of course, Chef and I are not here to be your medical professionals today, but if you are experiencing these kind of emotions. If you're feeling depressed, if you're feeling disconnected from life, take action quickly for sure. And, and I want to say something. It's not a bad thing. I yes. mean, don't look at it as don't look at it as a good thing, bad thing. That's not how you look at it. Look at it as something like that's not who you are. And you need to make some tweaks in your life to get back to that. And I have a few stories, you know, one or two that I mean I can talk to you about that. And sometimes maybe you need to pull back and it's okay. And it sucks. Maybe it's going to affect your bottom line. Maybe you're not going to pay your student loans off as fast as you wanted to or whatever. But remember what we were talking about. You can't go out and achieve what you want to achieve if you're not strong, if you don't feel good, if you're not invigorated, if you're not like, oh yeah, I'm excited about today. 
not like, oh my God, I have everything so to do good. with it. Come on, let's, you know, turn it around. Why do you think it's so common that we make ourselves wrong for the way we feel? That comment, hey, it's like, it's not about this is right or wrong. It's If you're depressed, you're depressed. Now let's take action and let's get out of that place. That's not who you are. But the judgment, the shame of that, that we put on ourselves, I am wrong because I feel this way. Why do you think that's such a common thing? I don't know. There, Yeah, there's a lot of things that are on you, a lot of pressures that are on you that you didn't even put there that are on you, but you've allowed them to be there. There's a difference with that. For me, I wholeheartedly believe that we all need to check ourselves, whether it's once a month or once every six weeks, whatever, check yourself. Look at, are you aligned? Are you growing? Look, I want to be like this. Are you moving like this? Okay, so you need to get yourself back aligned. So you need to, you need to have like safety nets to be able to catch yourself and to make mm -hmm. sure that you're growing and then doing the things that, the way that you need to be. You need, look, in order to stay alive these days, it's work. In order to be in a relationship, it's work. In order to be in a work relationship, it's work. Everything that you do, it's not like you get married and then that's it and then you don't have to work at it. It is work. And this is what people sometimes forget is that, yeah, I got a great job. It's work. I'm in a great relationship. It's work. Don't forget to do all of those great things. It's not about doing it in the first two months so the next 12 years you could live in the wrong way. It's about figuring out how to have that curve go, the longevity, and being able not just to give but to receive it back. I love that. And so I'll build on that. Not only is each of these areas work, but each one is also an opportunity for love, joy, passion, service, all these things. The marriage relationship, it's work. It's also a source of incredible joy, love, fulfillment, intimacy. The job, right. it's work. But it can also be what I encourage all my clients to connect with is a source of love, joy, passion, fulfillment, <sighs> service, Etc. Like right. the idea of work-life balance, what I hate about that phrase is how it implies this mental model that somehow on one side of our life is work and on the other side is this thing called life. And what you right. just said is perfect. It's like, it's all work, but it's all life. You know, and why, not... and why did, why did Zach, when did work get a negative connotation? Hey, you know, like, uh, Right, like work is not a bad thing. Cool mode, I go to work. I go to work. You know, it's like absolutely right. It's like that could be a good thing. It could be a positive thing. We're all working at things. We're all like engaged with things. Mm. That's not necessarily a bad thing. But careful now because we're starting to we're starting to get away from cooking, and I don't want people to to lose track of w cooking. Right. <laughs> well said, man. All right, so so that's true. We can't have a chef extraordinaire Charles Webb on the show and not dig into a little bit of the, the love and passion around food. So why don't you tell us, what are you, what are you cooking these days? Where's your focus and your passion with food? I know you've done it all, but what's really occupying your mind share when it comes to food these days? Well, the cool thing is I haven't done it all. That's the cool thing. Hashtag Chef on Tour is a digital series that encompasses food, travel, and lifestyle. Right now we're working on uh, building out our next cities, Medellin, Cartagena, Bogota in Colombia, Mexico City in Oaxaca in Mexico. We're looking at Bangkok. We're looking at Sri Lanka, uh, Colombo, Sri Lanka. That's the next, that's the next so horizon. Cool. And why us. don't you give us like two minutes on like what happens in each city, just so the listeners know what exactly we're talking about and how it works. Just as much as you're talking to very impactful or exciting or engaging people, we are doing the same thing, but we are finding our, sto our storytellers are the people who are telling the stories that are in that city. So they're either from that city or they're living in that city. So we just filmed in Barcelona. And as an example, Susu is a political activist from Myanmar, you know, remember Burma? They were uh, a year ago, almost today, they were taken over with a political coup. He's now living there. So he was our social the person we had under social, just a variety, you know, from sustainability to LGBTQ, to entrepreneurship, to music and fashion and wellness and fitness and design. And I love street art, cannabis and what that, what's happening with that, how it's, you know, dig, digging deeper into the medical and helping a lot of folks out there. But what does that look like? You know, I think that when we all travel, instead of picking up some of these really cool travel books or looking at their blogs and stuff like that, 
what I think what's happening is people really want to see what the heart and soul is of a city, right? Yes. And really to be able to get beyond the front street to get to the back street, because that's where the sexiness happens, and really understand what is the pulse. And by going into these lives, talking to these, or, you know, meeting these lifestyle let's call them storytellers, you're really figuring out what the pulse is of the city, which we love. Of course, there's me jaunting through the markets, all the open air markets and talking about all the cool stuff. There's some other content we're creating with like me cooking with a celebrity, me cooking with a granny, you know, because we know the grannies are the heart and soul of what's going on, right? There's just a lot we do. We create two experiences and generally like UNESCO World Heritage Sites that we bring 40 guests, you know, 40 vetted guests that could be influencers, nano, micro, macro, that could be leaders, activists, uh, our storytellers, people that we just think have the right energy that we'd like to really give back some uh, an experience around music, food, beverage in a very intimate setting. So it yes. could be the Teotitecan, the pyramids outside of Mexico City, the Sun Pyramid, it could be there. It could be in, in Barcelona. We did it at FC Barca, arguably the largest football club in the world, 250 million fans. And boy, that stadium is absolutely stunning. It might be in a speakeasy, like a Spy Granada, what we did. And you, if you can find that place, you're lucky and it's sexy, you know, and we want to just create this. You know, right now we're talking about Gosh, I mean, I, some things, certain things I can't talk about, other things I can, but, you know, Oaxaca, obviously known for its mezcal and what we'll do there, putting the Cajon's museum in Mexico City, potentially there, or Xochimilco. So it goes on and on. I can't let all the yeah, cats out of the bag. I but, mean, so much fun. And, you know, and for those who are like overwhelmed, even just hearing all these places and spaces, I'm I, think, overwhelmed. I, I hope that for everybody, it's inspiring to just re recognize and be present for a moment to the fact that the world is full of these incredible places to see, experience, and visit. And the food, the music, the culture, the beverage, and the variety, that spice of life as it's claimed. I mean, yeah. it's just what Chef Charles is doing is bringing that together in a really unique way in all these places. And then the letting content creators, including Chef, do their thing and share that with the world in a big way. And food is just one slice of that. But for me, it's just, I hear you talk and I'm sitting here like, wait, 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 I want to write that place down. Wait, I want to write that place down. I want to go. And yeah, so, there's, awesome. there's, there's so much of that. There's so much of that too. And there's so many hidden gems in the city. I think it's also like, we're not necessarily running to the monuments and stuff, but we're encapsulating the essence of a city by capturing the backdrop or maybe just the feel or the vibe of it while we do storyteller interviews and things of that nature. So it's not a one dimension, here, here we go, the, the multi-dimensional. It's not a uh, one-dimensional food yeah. show or one-dimensional travel show, or it's not just dial. And you know, the great thing about it is distribution is on YouTube, hashtag Chef on tour. And of course, Chef Charles Webb on Instagram. You can always find me. There's always ways to find me and see what we're doing. Imagine people like Anthony Bourdain doing what he was doing and he did it so well. We're not trying to, we're not, you know, that's a footprint that you can't, you can't jump into Jordan's footprint, you know? So you can't jump into you can, Anthony Bourdain, what he did and how he did it was amazing. But as things evolve, as they expand, as we move into a world where we could be very well streaming and, and maybe in the Philippines, while you're on your way to work and you're watching my content live, you know, where, where maybe, how about you're doing like VR, totally. where the VR movement totally. is going and like, how am I taking you there when you can't go there, but yet you want to feel it because you are going to go there. You're just not going to go there for a couple of months or maybe a year. Maybe it's, maybe it's on your bucket list. So, you know, just kind of like staying real and really understanding what is real in that city and what's real happening with these people. And what are these stories? Cause they should make you laugh. They should make you cry. They should make you want to yeah. lick your phone. Right. Yeah. All of those things. I love this. I love this. And, yeah. uh, okay. So we're going to, here's, here's what we're going to do. And we'll let the cat out of the bag about our, our little plan that we've cracked up oh, here, Chef Charles. So love it. right now I'm sitting in my same office that I'm always in here in Southwest Michigan recording with you and, and you're en route to Brazil. So we're going to do a part two of this conversation and continue because the idea of lifestyle engineering, the whole point of being intentional about your purpose, your values, your vision, and taking massive action to go make that real. Part of that for us includes this idea of travel and lifestyle and, and freedom. 
that so many people listening I know relate to. And so we're going to reconnect when I'm in Copper Mountain, Colorado. They're in the mm-hmm. Rockies enjoying some snowboarding. You're going to be on the beach somewhere in Purcell. We'll reconnect and pull this thread a bit further. So I'm really excited about that. But to land the plane for today, I want to ask you one more question. And it's related to this same idea I ask everybody who comes on the show. Great engineering. I'm sure mastering the art of creative work as a chef, but also great coaching. We know that questions lead, answers follow. And if we want to get better answers in our life, we want to ask better questions. And so I'm curious for your perspective, if the engineering leader listening to this wants to experience that lifestyle, that joy, that passion, what would be the best question you would lead them with today? Yeah, the best question. You know what I did once upon a time? I had a really big wall in my second bedroom that I wasn't using. And I took chalkboard paint and I painted that whole wall with chalkboard paint. And then I I let it dry, of course. And then I took chalk and I went on there and with no boundaries, no holes barred, no one telling me I could do something or I couldn't do something. I just went up there and I wrote whatever the F I wanted to write that inspired me, that got me excited, maybe something that I wanted to achieve or I wanted to accomplish, maybe a place that I wanted to travel to, maybe about with me about 30 and whatever that may mean, but I just dropped it all on there. And then I looked at it. I sat back and I looked at it and then I started going to work. I started connecting dots and I started connecting A with B and J with L. And I started doing all these things. And what I realized is they didn't completely connect, but what was missing from them connecting was way less than what I thought that would make them connect. But if I had limited myself and just not thought out of the box and thought about putting that up there, I would have never came to the same conclusion. That's so cool. I, I love that. I, I have a 101 things bucket list myself, and I challenge my clients to go through that process. But to put it all out there on the board, and I love this, go to work connecting dots. So do you have in your life that wall of desire? And have you started doing the work to connect the dots? I think that's awesome. Wow. Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. Do you have that wall in your house? And then how do you make it happen? It doesn't have to be a big wall. It doesn't have to be a small one. You know what? If you don't have the wall, get started. Get yourself. I I like to go to these stores, like these craft shops, like Michael's or um, Hobby Lobby. That's the one my mom likes. I like to go to those craft shops and I get like that really nice thick paper. And I I like to write it out and I get like the bigger, not like the, uh, the chief notepad. I like to get the big one and I write it out and I write everything on there because right now I'm, I'm kind of living like a, a digital nomad, like some of you guys might be digital nomads as engineers, which is another reason we're going to talk because as digital nomads, right. you can live anywhere in the world. And we'll save that for next time, but you're going to see where I'm at in Brazil. And I think that you're going to, we're going to have some things to talk about. That's for sure. But no yeah, question. I mean, if you don't have it again, you just got to start somewhere, put it up there. And then just by putting it up there, it's going to feel really good because maybe it's something materialistic. Maybe you want to drive a certain type of vehicle or you want to have a certain brand of a bike or something like that. It could be anything, but it's about, you'll find all the common denominators. That's right. You'll find the ones that aren't. And then you just kind of figure it out from there. I love that. So teasing where we're going next time with this idea of, hey, your ability to add value in the world is becoming increasingly location independent. And a lot of engineers are asking that question, what's possible? And companies are solving for that question in the way that they create roles. So we're going to explore that a little deeper next time. Chef, it's been amazing to spend time with you today. Have a safe flight. And thanks again for making time, brother. This is awesome. Hello, my friend. Zach White here again. And I wanted to let you know that's all we've got for this episode of the Happy Engineer Podcast. Thank you so much for investing your time with me today. It is an absolute pleasure to be able to bring you this content. Just as a reminder, it would be amazing if you would subscribe and share this episode with any other engineers you know who may benefit from this. And if you're like me, I hope that you'll take some notes and more importantly, take action. In our audio version of the podcast on Apple Podcasts and any place that you go to find podcasts, there's a little more content from me about this episode in the debrief. 
If you really want to hear about how to put this into action, I'd encourage you to go grab that. But thank you for joining us for the video version of our interview today. And again, can't thank you enough for helping us to get the word out about the Happy Engineer podcast and what we're doing. If there's any way we can serve you, would love to do that. Go find us at oasisofcourage.com or reach out to me on social media at Oasis of Courage. And don't forget again to subscribe and click the bell to have notifications of upcoming releases of new episodes of the podcast. As always, I want to leave you with this. If you stay in your comfort zone, you're not going to grow. So let's crush comfort, create courage, and let's do this.